What's up? What's going on Twitch? All my peeps. Um, and YouTube. If I'm uploading this to YouTube at the moment, I don't know. Um, anyways. I'm gonna play some more Moonlighter. Um, I have work in about two hours. But I'm gonna play for a little while. <coughs> I have been listening to one of my friends on, uh, He's this podcast about like video games and just nerdy stuff that, you know, whatever he's talking about. So I'm going to be listening to him in the background. <coughs> Luckily, I don't think it, I mean, I can easily put his name down to like everyone else. If you ever want to listen to him, you can. Um, he's pretty entertaining. He owns his own uh, video game shop over in Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is pretty awesome. Uh, it's called Game Trade. Um, so if you ever want to check him out, it's pretty awesome. His name's uh, I think his name's Greg, but it's he's really he's really uh, interesting to listen to. I'm gonna be playing him in the background while we play this game. So yeah. Under the age of 18. <clears throat> Just to catch you up, they're basically talking about some kind of legislation about loot boxes, but like games and stuff. How oh, like they have microtransactions and thinking about banning it, and he's putting his opinion in on it. That's As it. may be demonstrated by a the subject matter of the product. Okay, so. And I'm just going to throw this out here as not as a brony myself. So there's a My Little Pony game, there's microtransactions in it. The majority of people playing it are over 18 year old men <laughs> being bronies. But that subject matter is for kids. What does that mean? Does that mean a cartoon? So does that mean if they made a Batman animated game? That. I mean, does that mean that that subject matter is for kids because it's a cartoon? How many of us adults watch cartoons still? Is it anime going to be considered a, a subject matter of a game? That can't be? You know, you get what I'm saying at here, and and this really interesting thought because uh, the next point, the visual content of the product, most games, especially indie games nowadays, use a very simplified art style to get over the production costs of having incredibly detailed character models. So you see this very minimalistic and simplistic. So look, Fortnite's a great example. Other games similar to that. That's an that's an art style. As much as I personally don't care for it, that's an art style. So is that going to be considered something that would make it a kid's game just because it has a cartoony-looking art style? That's kind of how broad this is. You could see someone making that argument. C, the music or audio content of the product. So what if it's a game that's like a horror-themed game, but it has nursery rhymes in it to creep you out? Is a nursery rhyme, that's music that is content that's aimed towards kids? You see what I'm going at with this, right? D, the use of animated characters or activities that appeal to individuals under the age of 18. Again, so under the age of 18 is so ridiculous too because we're talking about 16 to 18 year olds, like like what a 16 year old likes and what a five year old likes are completely different, but you're gonna loop, you know, lump that all into the same sort of thing. So next we have the age of the characters or models in the product. <laughs> so now if you have a game where you have kids in it, but there's loot boxes, then that means that it's going to be considered a kid's game. The presence in the product of celebrities who are under the age of 18, celebrities who appear to to individuals, celebrities who appear to individuals under the age of 18. So even if you're not an eight, under 18 celebrity, but you look and appear to be under 18, that can make a game considered a kid's game. Oh my goodness, this like keeps getting worse. Uh, celebrities who appeal to individuals under the age of 18. What does that even mean? Could you argue that, that PewDiePie is an individual who, who appeals to individuals under the age of 18? So if there's a PewDiePie game that is rated M for Mature and is only for adults, but because he has audience members under that, that they're going to play it? That's, that's their fault? You see where we're going, right? This is ridiculous. I'm just going to keep going here. The language used in the product. The content of materials used to advertise the product and the platforms on which such materials appear. I'll actually kind of agree with that because if you're advertising only on like Disney Kids or XD Kids or whatever, like yes, yes, then you're obviously trying to get the kids to play. Other reliable empirical evidence relating to the composition of the audience the, or the audience of the product as intended by the publisher or other evidence demonstrating that the product is targeted at individuals under the age of 18. Okay, um, so 
any game that meets that extensive and frankly all-encompassing definition would be banned from including loot boxes and pay-to-win microtransactions if their product reaches more than 1,000 users annually. Pay-to-win mechanics defined in the bill include paying to get an upper hand on other players, paying to unlock something you could earn through normal gameplay, or paying to ease your progression through the game. It would not include difficulty levels, add-on content, or cosmetic items. However, if the latter item is only earned through a loot box and is considered a feature of the product, it would be banned. Publishers would also be prohibited from adding in those mechanics after a game launches. So let's talk about this for instance. Let's say um, it would not include add-on content and cosmetic items. However, if the latter items only earned through a loot box and considered a feature of the product. So let's say what is it only loot boxes again this is so vague this is what's frustrating or is it just random drops what if you have a boss that only has like a one percent chance to drop items something like world of warcraft dungeon i mean could, could someone make the argument that bosses in world of warcraft are, are loot are, are loot crates <laughs> because you know and you don't obviously buy them that's something you have to achieve through skill but you understand like where we're, we're planting seeds here on schools of thought and and once that thought gets I don't, I don't like to use the, the, the basic term slippery slope, but that's kind of where we're going with something like this. Like you're starting at the top and it's like, well, where will people take this once you set a precedent that this is okay to, to be here? And so uh, it goes on to talk about the bill can be read here in its entirety. It currently has two co-sponsors and Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts and Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. Mr. Blumenthal is no stranger to tackling the video game industry before he was elected to the Senate. Blumenthal filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court for Brown versus EMA. It is unclear how far this bill will go. It has bipartisan support, and I imagine many people reading this right now are pumping their fists at the idea. Intrusive loot boxes and pay-to-win mechanisms could soon be a thing of the past for Americans. In an interview with Kotaku's Jason Schreier, Hawley said, that's the senator, he believes video game companies are worried. So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this. Um, that's the next article we're going to talk about. We're going to move on to Hawley's interview with Jason Schreier. And this was on the 21st, so a week ago today. Um, is Republican Senator Josh Hawley an advocate for video game players or an ambitious politician with a savvy staff who knows a win-win argument when they see one? The freshman senator from Missouri, who plans to soon introduce a bill, is now introduced. If this loot box bill passes as, as proposed, it will make it a findable offense for publishers to put loot boxes in games that target children or are played by children. It will also ban pay-to-win mechanics in those games. In a short phone interview on Monday, I asked Hawley some questions about whether this loot box bill can pass, how it came about, and whether it's just a publicity stunt. You can read the interview here, lightly edited for clarity. Um, so first, Jason Schreier asked, first of all, I'm curious, do you have a personal stake in the issue? Is this something you've encountered in video games you've played? To which he replies, I have to be honest with you, Jason, I am not myself a gamer, so it does not stem from my personal experience. It stems from being a parent of two little boys and talking to lots of parents and also nearing, by the way, and also hearing, by the way, from lots of gamers who are concerned about what the C-suite is doing here, basically adding casinos to children's games. Schreier then asked, do you do your kids play games with loot boxes in them? And Holly replies, they do not yet. They're six and four, so they're not playing any video games at the moment. But I've heard from lots of parents who say their kids, the stories about all of a sudden these changes. What are these weird changes? Uh, excuse me, what are the charges? What are these weird charges on my card? I thought I already paid for the game. How about... Oh, how is it I'm being asked to pay more? Did I authorize this? How did the kid buy it? We've heard from gamers, too, talk about this ruining the integrity of the game by essentially changing the way the game works. So let me just stop there for a second, because, again, we hear this all the time. We need to ban violent games. We need to ban all this stuff because parents can't properly teach their kids. Now, it seems like the senator himself has a six- and four-year-old who he does not allow to play games. But now he's talked. But he's talked to parents. Anecdotal evidence that he's talked to parents and he's talked to gamers that all hate loot boxes. And and the concern isn't that they hate loot boxes. No, no. The concern is that it's about the kids. Remember, we t I've said this many times on this podcast. It's about it's about the kids. It's for the kids, man. We got to save the kids. It's like you don't care about the kids. Just be honest about it. You don't like loot boxes, and you'll take any chance to get rid of them. And that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. I, I don't care. But just understand that, like, you're being a hypocrite if you're lying. About it. Just be honest about it. Say, you know what? I don't care. I'll do anything to get rid of loot boxes, even if I have to shield myself behind this child. 
So Schreier then goes on to ask, you mentioned parents finding charges from their kids suddenly showing up on their credit card bills. That can happen a lot with microtransactions that aren't loot boxes. Why focus specifically on loot boxes? To which Holly replies, both loot boxes and pay to win. We think the reason why is that it's foremost addiction development. It's an attempt for kids to, as I said before, adding casinos to kids' games in an attempt to get them hooked in an attempt to exploit them. We don't allow actual casinos to exploit children in this way. Why should we allow the gaming industry to do so? These C-suite executives who are driving this trend. I don't know what that means. C-suite. I'll be honest, I don't know what he's talking about. There must just be like executives, game executives or something. I don't know. So, uh, I, I understand where he's coming from here a little bit, and I will, I will yield this to the point where, yes, I, I think that you should not be using gaming gambling tendencies in games that are meant for little kids or even i mean if, if an adult wants to like say a game like candy crush but you know that like as much candy crush sells like a big game, you know that a lot of those people play it. and so you're trying to get them into this mindset of you can only play so much and you have to wait if you don't want to wait you can pay us money now again is that the same thing as gambling though you know and i understand loot box is what he's focusing on loot boxes and randomness, but you're technically getting a prize every time. So is there, there's a difference between gambling and randomization and random prizes. I, I do feel like that. Again, I hate loot boxes. If I should have like an alert. I hear I hit my stream deck. You're like beep beep. You know, fourth time, fifth time. Greg hates loot boxes. Man, 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 you know, because I hate loot boxes. Uh, and and I and I, I can't I can't stress enough. That I want loot boxes gone. So I, I I wish the industry would find a better way. But legislation is not that better way. So anyway, they go on to say, uh, Schreier asks, why focus specifically on children? Adults can't also be, or he asks, adults can't also be exploited by these casinos? To which Holly replies, adults can for sure be exploited. I think that children, there are a couple things we know in a variety of contexts, whether it's casinos proper or public health issues. We often look at kids and say they're uniquely vulnerable. They don't necessarily know the nature of these microtransactions being on the lookout for them in the way that an adult might. And while I realize that these microtransactions, these particular kinds, compromise the integrity of the game no matter who is subject to them, there's something I think that's pretty unique to kids and the addiction angle I think is pretty unique to kids as well. So this is an area too where I think we ought to be able to come together on a biased partisan basis and say, look, when you're directing this sort of pro-addiction activity, pro-addiction behavior towards children or practices towards children, we ought to be able to say no to that. I'm going to agree with them here. I'm going to totally agree with that. If it's exploitive of kids and you're purposely trying to get them into this hook, I, I understand. But again, this bill doesn't, it, it just says loot boxes and microtransactions. Microtransactions, you know, I mean, DLC add-ons used to be microtransactions. You know, I know it says that it bans cosmetic loot, but microtransactions is a very broad term that I don't know. I, I mean, loot boxes are specific at least, but microtransactions aren't. They're, they're, what, what, what's a microtransaction? It's, it's small little purchasable things in a game. That, that, that could be a weapon. It could be anything. It could, and again, they said no cosmetic items, but it is cosmetic items are, are microtransactions as well as are non-cosmetic items. So they had to like, specify that. So Schreier goes on to ask, have you been in conversation with the ESA, the video game's lobbyist group, or any other video game companies about how this might impact them? And he said, yes, we have. And Schreier said, can you describe the nature of these conversations? To which senior policy advisor Jacob Reeses, or Reeses, who was on the conference call, said, this is Jacob here. I think it's fair to say the industry has concerns about this. We've been trying to be very transparent with them, but there may be some difference of opinion. Uh, to which Hawley says, Jacob's being very diplomatic. And Schreier says, yes, any elaboration you can make here? I ask because I pay a lot of attention to these financial calls that these companies have. And EA, for example, is very reliant on the loot box income that comes in from FIFA games. A lot of these companies are very reliant on this stuff. Hawley replies, and FIFA would indeed be covered by this legislation, to be clear. They've certainly expressed their, shall we say, concern over this legislation. But I think that's probably a good indication that we're getting somewhere. Schreier then asks, do you think you're getting somewhere? I've seen cynicism from financial analysts, from people in the game sphere, skepticism that this will actually pass. Certainly some concerns that this might just be a publicity stunt. 
To which Holly replied, I think if they thought it was a publicity stunt, they wouldn't be so concerned. I think the reaction of a corporate lobbyist sort of strongly suggests that they're very worried about this. I think it probably also suggests that they know this practice is not going to stand up to public scrutiny. Once parents really understand what's going on here, and once the general public understands how these games are being manipulated, how their integrity is being compromised, and how basically these companies have found a way to make whole gobs of money without really being upfront about it, and of course the addictive nature of it, I think they're pretty worried that it's going to result in public uh, backlash, and it should. Schreier then replied, Public backlash is one thing, but I can't imagine that many of your colleagues in Congress know enough or care enough about video games. Can this actually get traction among those folks? To which Holly replies, I think everybody, though, cares about the health and safety of kids, and they should care about this broader problem of what I've started calling the addiction economy, which this is a great example. We see this in other spheres, by the way. We see it in social media. We're seeing it here in the gaming industry, and you've got these corporations finding new ways to try to hook folks, extract personal information from them in the case of social media, extract money of them in the case of games without regard to what that does to either in case of the gaming or the game itself, and then to people's general health and well-being. So I think there's a lot of concern about that, and we hope to drive a conversation in this space. <clears throat> so before I continue, I want to say something about that as well. So... Schreier makes a good point and says, do people actually care about video game loot boxes? And and he says, well, no, probably not, but people do care about kids. <laughs> so now we will have a whole bunch of senators and and, and congress, congress people who don't know anything about how this stuff works going, oh, yeah, addictive stuff for kids. Yeah, it's, that's easy, man. Let's just not, let's just ban it. Let's, we don't know anything about it, but let's ban it. It hurts kids, you said? Okay, yeah, let's ban it. <laughs> So this, this is frustrating. This is frustrating. Um, so we've got a few more questions here. I want to get through this. Uh, Schreier then at, uh, states, Previous attempts to regulate the video game industry, most infamously in 2010 or 2011, with a Supreme Court case about violent video games, have all failed. I believe a state senator in Hawaii was looking to introduce loot box legislation that also failed. So I guess you'll have to count me as skeptical, <laughs> as this has how much of a chance of getting traction in Congress. Holly then says, we'll see. Certainly the reception we've gotten from parents from and from gamers has been absolutely tremendous. And we intend to push forward. I think this is something that people should be aware of. I think it's an issue that more and more people are going to care about as they learn about, and it'll be the start of a broader conversation. He even says it himself. It's a start of a broader conversation. About what? A broader conversation about, well, so let's say that they follow these rules, and any game that you know might be marketed towards kids, well, Fortnite is basically marketed towards kids it has guns in it and uh okay well kids can't play it anymore fortnite's banned oh PUBG. well PUBG is aimed towards adults but they have they have steam data that says that people between the ages of 15 and 17 play it so PUBG's banned call of duty black ops 4 has kids playing up oh, that's banned anything that even remotely resembles anything going towards a kid is banned if that subject is deemed damaging to that child and again what's a child right what's a child is a child eight under eight of 18 <laughs> i mean my goodness you know 16 15 16 17 they're, they're still children at this point where like they're they're they need to be protected um and maybe that is a case i don't know i i do feel like we've our, our growth as a society is being stunted like kids seem to be kids into their 20s now when you know i felt like i left the house you know, I think I left the house at like 19 or 20. You know, I stayed there for the year I went to college and then left eventually after that. And then, you know, but now you see some kids staying at home till 23, 24, 25, you know, so maybe they're still kids. Maybe 20, maybe it needs to be 25 and under are kids. I don't know. This is the point though, is that it's, it's, it's too vague. You can't, it, when they use these vague terms, all they're doing is causing, um, they're leaving it open for interpretation. And whoever interprets it could interpret it any different way. So it might even not even be what people are considering in the beginning. So Schreier then goes on to say, Republican philosophy is general all about personal accountability. Microtransactions. Nobody's forced to pay for them or buy loot boxes. Why not let the free market decide their fate? To which Holly replies, Well, similarly as with casinos, we don't allow children to go into casinos. We very carefully control, regulate what our children are exposed to. This is well within the model. This is something every parent should care about, and I actually don't think that exerting, when people understand that what's essentially happening here is online gambling being inserted into these games, I think a concern about, to which Schreier interrupts, 
kudos to him, I suppose. And that's not what you're talking about here. Your bill also includes pay-to-win games, which are not gambling. They're paying for perks in a game. To which Holly replies, similar though, once again, it's a microtransaction that's not necessarily expected, especially from a child up front. So now, now we're leaking into something else. So now we're leaking into, well, what? so an, a microtransaction, what about DLC? So you bought a game for 60 bucks, and then a year later, they're going to release a $10 extra mission for Ghost Recon or something. That wasn't expected when they bought the game. So now that microtransaction is outlawed. What? You know, he's, th this is a problem. Like, this, his lack of understanding how this stuff works like, is a problem. Uh, so then Schreier goes on to say, what would you say to a video game company that says, hey, without these things, you're going to cause us to crash and cause this entire industry to fold? And to which Holly replies, these are very resourceful people. <laughs> and I'm sure they can design games that don't rely on gambling directed at children in the center of the game. I'll give them a little bit of that. Like, I'll, I'll give them that, that, that the gaming industry can survive without it. There are plenty of games, especially we're seeing this kind of indie revolution come back. And so there is this sort of... There, there is this, this comeback to a normal sense of you can still make games without that. Now, will those games make as much money? No. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. They're making the games making the most money, which are games that have microtransactions. Like they said, FIFA makes them the most money because of their weird, like, buy packs of cards thing. Bad makes them a ton of money because of that. Like, that, that's what they're going to do while they can. So then your argument could be, well, Greg, why not ban it? force the companies to make those great games without microtransactions again. Because, like he says, they're resourceful. They're going to find a new way to plug you for money, dude. And here's what's probably going to happen with this bill if it gets passed. So the ESA is a lobbying group for the video game industry, right? Video game publishers, most notably. They're going to come out and they're going to say, we'll give you a whole bunch of money. You, you get this bill passed, it's fine, but we want these amendments. We want it not to include sports games because sports betting is allowed. We want it not to include this, this, or this. And they'll get something changed so it doesn't affect them because that's what lobbying does. You know, a good lobbyist doesn't try to completely stop dead in the water. They try to let the law go through, destroy the competition that isn't a part of their lobbyist group while allowing the people they are lobbying for to be successful. And so here we are. <laughs> so, and again, it's just, you know, Okay, and then the PR guy steps in, Mike Berg. Hey, Jason, we got time for one more question. So as Jason replies, something I've actually personally curious about, and this is not related, but I know you count Peter Thiel among your contributors. Have you ever talked about what it was like to try to obliterate my company? To which Holly replies, we have not, so I don't have any personal information there. Uh, what, what is this? Let me, hold on, what is this? Oh, so Peter Thiel. Feel. Apparently, Gawker owns Kotaku. I knew that. Uh, in May, Forbes broke the news that Silicon Valley investor Peter Thiel bankrolled Hulk Hogan's infamous sex tape lawsuit against the now bankrupt Gawker. You might be wondering, so what? Why should I care? Chris already that Thiel's money gives other billionaires a blueprint for how to... Uh. Okay, well, I don't understand that. But anyway, I guess that was a joke. <laughs> a joke that... Right over my head, so that's fine. So... <sighs> Okay, let me go back to this because the first article where we talked a little bit about it, there were some comments. And I want to go over these comments a little bit. Um, this first one, which has 42 upvotes, uh, got my attention right away. And, and there's a little bit of hypocrisy here, so let's go through it. And again, it's just an internet user, so it's fine. But he says, you know what? I have no sympathy for the industry or ESA over this. They've had months and years to get their shit together and try to put a stop to this, but they decided not to, and this is the result. I'm not in favor of government regulating media like this, but this is what it takes to keep microtransactions out of $60 games, then fine. And if it means losing mobile games like Pokemon Go, Fire Emblem's Hero, then so be it. Okay. So, first of all, this isn't just about $60 games. So, first of all, get that is a, is a moot argument. And if it means losing mobile games like these ones I've noted that I probably don't play, then so be it. You know, if he liked these games and cared about them, he'd be fighting for them. So it's fine. Uh, but there was another one here. Um, let me. It was something about. Uh, uh, where was it here? 
Yep, here we go. No pity for the sweatshops that are the AAA game industry. May their skeletons be brought to light. So if you leave, if you read this, he's talking about the sweatshops that are AAA game industry. So he's talking about workers' rights and how they feel, he feels or she feels that uh, they're manipulated, okay, and that they're taken advantage of, okay. So the answer to that question then is burn the whole industry down, which would result in hundreds of thousands of job loss. Yeah, that, that's a great that is a that is a grade A argument there, buddy. Stupidest, stupidest thing I've read all day. <laughs> so let's 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 destroy the AAA game industry so that because they have crappy worker environments. <laughs> and then let's not have jobs for all these people who are in the game industry making the games that you try to enjoy. Hmm. You know, it's it's so frustrating to me that uh, that this is the basic understanding. Uh, this person goes on to make my point. There are a lot of problems with the way this bill is written, but I wouldn't miss anything the bill purports to dispose of. In a perfect world, the sketchy microtransaction practice will be re replaced by no-cost, user-friendly options. But ultimately, this is probably close, closer to cutting off one head of the Hydra. <laughs> And then this, uh, and then this person, and considering how the AAA goons will fight tooth and nail to prevent this bill from ever getting approved, it'll be like signing a document in triplicate for a sword license and a Hydra slaying license before our brave hero was even allowed to take one swing at the eight-headed copies. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, th this argument's not, it's not a good argument. And again, don't hide behind the kids. At least the senator, I will admit, is, is focusing on the kids angle. But then. They made the they made the bill too broad, where it's leaking so heavily into non kid games, and that's going to cause a real problem. So, to, in in closing with all of this, I just want to say my my point on this has not changed, and it will probably not change anytime soon. I respect and appreciate that gambling addiction is a real thing; it affects people, not the majority of people. In fact, it's quite the minority of people that affects that play video games are affected by any sort of video game addiction a uh, gambling addiction so yes do i wish that the esa and and the big guys like ea activision and ubisoft i would do do i wish they could come together and figure out a way to to lighten these loot box issues mm. and, and to appease people and to do it in a way that isn't so abrasive so that we wouldn't have people wanting government intervention yes is it ever going to happen probably not you know, part of why there are regulations in the government, or the government creates regulations, I should say, is because companies don't step up. And I, I would be the first to admit this. I wish the companies would handle themselves. Because, you know, they have to make protections about dumping toxic waste in the water, because it's cheaper to dump toxic waste in the water than it is to pay a company to take care of it. And, and a company is going to do what it can to make the most money it can and save the money it can. So you can't... Like, and that's the company, right? And that doesn't mean that the CEO and other people couldn't come together and say, we can be responsible as a company and still make money. They can. But will they? I mean, mm. probably not. Probably not. But we should never want government regulation. This is a first step in what then would become the, the video game industries. You know, one of the things I always say about this is I love about the video game industry is we got to see it grow up. You know, and I know not everybody, but myself, I watched it be a, a nothing niche thing and blow up into the pop culture icon that it is today. So we're unfortunately we have to watch the growing pains with that as well. And I, I watched the stuff in the 90s. I remember that when when it was the, the Violence Act. And that's why the ESA came up with the ESRB rating system as a way to say, look, we'll, we'll handle regulating. We'll get the big retailers like GameStop, Walmart to sign on to this. Best Buy, Target, they won't sell games to minors that are rated M mature. They have made strides. Okay, and, and, and so... To, to argue that they haven't done anything to avoid regulation would be false, but this is the new age. And so the ESA does have to step up, in my opinion, and they need to figure this out because this is only going to keep happening. This is only going to get worse. No matter how many times these fail, there's always going to be someone introducing a new one. And eventually they're going to get it to a point where they can get it passed. Whew, I did not expect to talk about that that long, but I'm glad I did because it's helping burn up some time. <laughs> so uh, since I only had two topics, I was a little nervous about the time. But, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Now, move over this. And we're going to see about this Twitter thing. Can I do this? Is that okay? Yeah, let's just do this. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? It's live. Uh, yeah, and, and so just a final thought on the uh, loot boxes thing. Again, I totally understand why people hate loot boxes, and it's fine to hate them, but let's not, let's not lie and say it's for the kids. Let's talk about what it really is. We just don't like the practice, and we shouldn't support it. It's just like the unionization of game developers thing. 
and, and I actually almost retweeted this out yesterday, but I didn't because it was Memorial Day, and I'm trying not to be a total ass bag. But someone tweeted something about, you know, it says, um, you know, uh, gamers, and it says something like, you know, take care of your employees. We, you know, we don't, we don't want, you know, you should unionize. They should unionize and, and take better care of your workers. And then below it says also gamers, and it's like a picture of. Um, someone making a comment at like a games room being like ship my game but with them being lazy and stuff you know and 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 so the, the point though was that we could fix everything us the consumer could fix everything wrong in the game industry but we can't all agree we're all individuals and we're never going to agree that we'll not buy any game that has microtransactions in it if we could agree on that and then we all stopped buying rocket league or PUBG or or any of those games and they stopped making money, they would find a new way to try to trick us into spending money. So it, it, it just doesn't really change anything. Um, but yeah, so I just don't want government regulation in it. And I'm not a small government guy, uh, necessarily. I, I, I think regulations do where it's due, but I'd always rather see the industry regulate itself first. I, I'm a fan of personal accountability. And I want, I want personal accountability from the companies that make these things to understand that they've been taking and taking, they've been skirting a line for a long time, they have to realize it, and they have to turn it around before it becomes too big a deal. So next up on the podcast, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I want to talk first about this story of... This is not the only website I could find that actually did an article about it because I wanted to get the gist of the story, and I have some tweets I want to go through. But basically, it seems like over the weekend, I think over the weekend or the last couple days... May 26. Yeah, over the last couple days, a prototype for an unreleased Famicom RPG called Indie the Magical Kid appeared at auction. And so, actually, it was probably about a week or so ago I was on auction, and then it went through. And the reason I'm talking about the story is because a private seller ended up outbidding uh, a crowdfunded attempt to purchase the game so they could dump the ROM and preserve it. And, and I am a fan of game preservation, uh, certainly. I think we want to keep these things around as long as we can. Uh, and so this one was an interesting story because this forest of illusion, must have been the person who started the crowdfunding, tweeted out, I regret to inform that we have lost the auction on the cancelled Famicom slash NES game Indie the Magical Kid. It ended up selling for a total of 1,500,000 yen, <laughs> which is approximately 13 to 15 thousand dollars with 130 bids so that's that's where this thing went a lot of people wanted this we quite simply didn't have enough funds sad face and it's kind of sad um because an unreleased game could be really cool but we never heard of even unreleased in japan it's not like it came out in japan and was unreleased here like this is straight up never came out anywhere and we don't even know the condition of the prototype we don't know how complete it was things like that uh, force of illusion goes on to say that's another prototype that we'll likely never see again we would like to thank any everyone who shared our initial tweet and everyone who pledged donations to the few who donated early your donations have been refunded thank you so it was a crowdfunding that people pledged donations and made donations they were bidding and then people were able to get a refund if they did pledge but since they didn't win the auction so it was held honestly and upfront, which is great to make things worse, the winner of the auction left an anonymous message saying he bought it to stop, quote, copy sales and dumps. Nice. That's what Forest of Illusion says. Nice. So I think that was a very sarcastic nice. I don't believe him to think it's actually nice. Um, uh, and then he, they go on to say, I'm... I am hope he is happy that he spend 1.5 million yen on a video game just so nobody can dump it. Quote, I will always protect it as a Japanese treasure, end quote, is what he says. This is insane. Again, that was Forced of Illusions tweets. And, mm, yeah, okay, let's get through the rest of it, and I guess I'll throw out some opinion there. Um, so then um, BYUU on Twitter uh, tweets out, this is how game preservation ends. We all raised over $7,000 to try and preserve this unreleased Famicom prototype. It just sold for $13,750. Also, a collector could put it on their shelf to bit rot, secure in the knowledge no one else will ever be allowed to play it. Sad face. It's... I think that's a little dramatic. This is how game preservation ends. No, I don't think that's fair. And I actually think that... Uh, one of the one of the tweets here, I think, actually even says. Maybe I, did I close it? 
Michael's right. One of the tweets even here says, yeah, SNES Central. I have said this before. We should focus on what we can save and move on from things we can't. This is disappointing, but also remember seven unreleased SNES games and soon to be eight have been free re freely released this year already. We will find more. So I, I, I agree with that. And, and not that you can't be upset over the loss. I think that's fair. I think it's fair for them to be disappointed because they wanted to find this game, dump it, translate it, make it available for people to play. And so I don't give them a hard time at all. I, I'm not giving him a hard time at all. Um, him or her, sorry, I don't know. Be, by you, son. Be, be you, son. Um, but I think it's a little dramatic to say this is how game preservation ends. It was, it was a noble effort to raise $7,000 to try to preserve it. Um, maybe what these game preservations need, just like artifacts that go into museums, they need rich benefactors that are willing to put down $15,000 to get a prototype and then let them dump it. Uh, and I think the reason for not, the reason that person bought it and then isn't dumping it, I'm sorry, I know this is unpopular, I think that's fair. Someone who is a collector, and I think it's a little unfair to say, to put it on a shelf to bit rot, secure in the knowledge, like he's acting like this person was a cartoon villain. And that they purposely bought this just so no one else could have it. And and while that might be why they bought it, they might have been a huge fan. This might have been an employee who worked on the game. You don't know who it was. And so, and it could just be a game collector who wants to have everything. It could be someone who wants to buy it. Maybe they'll dump the ROM, have that, and then resell the game for a profit, and then release the ROM or something. We don't know. But I think it's a little, I think it's a little overdramatic. I just have to be honest. And it goes on to say, it isn't, uh, Bayou Sun goes on to say, it isn't even this specific game, it's the precedent set. Even as a community, we can no longer fundraise to these exorbitant levels to preserve even obscure titles. We've been effectively priced out of the market. I, this is one time. You know, I mean, like, this is one, they've saved, I mean, they've unreleased, they've saved, this has happened before, they've always gotten to do it, this was one time. And it's very obscure. And it's a Japanese RPG. It's very, very obscure. I, I don't know. I just feel like it's a little bit of an overreaction. While we're on the subject, I'd like to just reiterate that every single new game I've found and every scan I've created has been made publicly available. My approach is no different than no intro, redump, etc. I abhor, I abhor hoarding, and I'll do everything I legally can to save games. This is all easily proven factual via, via SNES Central and datomatic.nointro.org but we unfortunately live in a time where those with ill intent can just keep repeating false claims over and over without consequences until others believe it. Are people accusing him of not doing the same thing? Is that what's happening here? Uh... No, okay. Uh, well, apparently people are always challenging. Well, let's take a look at this and see what some of the people are saying. Um... There's always the very, very slim chance it's another uh, preservationist. Well, how do you know it's a slim chance? Come on. Maybe there's a class problem here. Maybe it's not a good thing that any individual feels so comfortable that they'll drop 14000 on a video game. I think that's ridiculous. I think we can spend any amount of money on anything that brings us joy. I really don't see a problem with that. Um, now, I brought up uh, Josh Fairhurst. So Josh is the uh, head of Limited Run. So somebody who makes a living um, making limited print and hard to find rare items he replied the buyer apparently wants to prevent reproduction carts from being sold while it sucks that this game won't be preserved i have to admit that i was astounded by how quick people were to start selling reproductions of the recent dumps of uwc and sim city nes and that's a great point so uwc was that unreleased wrestling game i talked about a few months ago and sim city nes was an unreleased nes prototype so yes as much as it sucks again i'm kind of with josh here as much as that sucks, there is a reason why somebody might want to do this. Josh goes on to say, it's probably a strong opinion, but I think people monetizing these dumps by selling reproductions are partly to blame for people's reluctance to allow their prototypes and unreleased games to be dumped. Yes, I think that's 100% it. And if there wasn't such a quick market and such an easy way to take an, a dump, you know, <laughs> to take a dump, to dump a ROM game, it is easy to take dumps sometimes. <laughs> Um, so then, though, I wanted to go a little further because there were some weird comments like, wait, so the buyer doesn't want people to profit off of repro cards, so instead decides no one gets to experience it? I'll never understand the mentality that because some people will abuse a good thing, we should just get rid of the good thing entirely. That ultimately does the most harm. I don't disagree with that, except that it's not like the person bought it and then destroyed it. 
it still exists. It just exists in that person's collection. It happens with art all the time. Which to, someone else makes a, a a comment down here that uh, you know, or or someone else on Twitter made a comment about, well, you know, I buy art reproductions of A Starry Night, and that doesn't decrease the value of the original. We're talking about very old paintings compared to an unreleased video game. So let's. We're, yes, they're collectibles, but this is not the same level of collecting yet. Reproductions absolutely do affect the market. And and I'm sorry, it's, it's the truth. As somebody who buys and sells video games for a living, I can tell you that, yes, prices will typically... Reproductions will usually tank the price initially, but then the prices usually bounce back. Earthbound bounced back. Yes, people aren't wrong when they say that. There's tons of Earthbound repros out there. But some games that don't bounce back... The Mario Party games, Mario Kart, those N64 repos that hit the market really strong like a couple of years ago, and it was it last year, April of 2004, that has affected the long-term price of those SNES games. Now again, are they rare collectibles? No. Would the prices be affected by the ROM being dumped? No. If you could argue that this is the only copy of the game in existence, I don't think dumping the ROM would affect it. But what's really going to affect it is if someone finds another one. Or if they're now that people know where to look, maybe they found it and know what company might have had it or what. Come on. Now they'll, maybe someone looks at this auction and goes, "Holy crap! I have one of those. I can get killing, thirteen thousand bucks for it. I'm gonna put mine on the auction site." And so we might even see another one pop up very soon. And then once you have two, guess how much that goes for? It usually goes for less. It's gonna decrease the value. Maybe they can get the next one. The the idea that only one prototype of this exists is probably more far fetched than than any other idea that the person is. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's way more far-fetched to believe that there's only one copy of this project in existence. So, I, I, I really believe it. We'll probably see another one pop up. Maybe someone else who's got one in a personal collection will, will dump it and then keep it in their personal collection and not sell it. Or maybe they'll do what... I think someone else did this recently. There was like a crowd like a crowd fund for, um, you know, someone who had a game who'd bought it. And they were like, hey, we'll give you $7,000 if you, like, dump the ROM. And then they pay them to basically dump it. Um... <clears throat> So uh, this person goes on to say that's why I don't support retro game reproductions. The other main reason is people profiting off the work of people who made ROM hacks and translations without compensating them. Very true. I typically only buy ROM hacks from the actual creators. Um, you people, yeah, people almost feel entitled to these unreleased ROMs. Like you want to be Robin Hood and dump it, pay the money for it. So this person's a little harsh on it, but that's kind of what they try to do. To which Justin replies, not as entitled as these man children that spend all that money just to hoard the rarities. So again, I don't understand why the video game industry people are eating each other. And this is again, now, so now we're going back to the uh, people who buy video games for a lot of money were our man children. Okay, so man children that spend, hoard, hoard rarities and spend all that money in video games. And now we're going back to the video gamers and kids. We live in our parents' basement. I mean, this article here did the same thing. It said, um, where was it here? said something like where was it it just said something it was like another dig on something like that uh, um, let's see here uh, I can't find it but basically this article did oh yeah okay odds are good that wh wherever this collector lives the indie the magical kid prototype will remain in his basement until the day he dies okay so we're all we're all basement dwelling uh, nerd man children again why are people in the gaming game collecting industry calling each other out again and and like feeding into these garbage things? That person could be that person who bought that could be the biggest humanitarian on the planet. They could be donating millions of dollars a year to charities that save hundreds of thousands of kids in Africa. You don't know that. Okay, so just to assume that he's a, a selfish man baby in his parents' basement who spends fifteen thousand dollars a game is just stupid. And I'm I'm sick of this auto attack going on just because someone wants to spend the money on it. And so um, yeah, that's pretty much it. But I don't see how, I don't see how it's being entitled if you bought something and you want to keep it to yourself. I'm sorry, I don't think that's entitled. I think that's poor usage. Um, are are a general, are are there people in this in this hobby that are generally selfish people? Yes. I mean, haven't you run across anybody who wants to sell something for over eBay value and then when they want to buy something from you, they want it at half eBay price? I mean, it's all over the place, unfortunately. And so it is frustrating, and I and so I understand totally why um, Bayou Sun is upset about it, and I totally get why game preservationists who pledged money to this would be upset. I totally get it. You're not in the wrong. I don't want to imply that at all, but 
unfortunately, this is that person's prerogative. They had the money, they bought it, and this what happened. And it's, so it's totally fine to be upset about it. I just don't think it's time to burn the whole preservationist thing down and be like, oh, you know, preservationist. Pres You're still doing good work. Keep up the good work. One slips by, nine are getting done. I think that's I think that's a pretty good ratio, if you ask me. All right, and so that's uh, that's it for the news stories today. So let's hit let's hit the uh, let's hit the the pickup pile. So here's the pickup pile. Um, first up is Raiden fighting uh, Raiden fighters aces for the Xbox 360. It's a great shmup. Um, that came out on the Xbox 360. Not many Japanese games made it to the 360, but this was one of them, and it's really good. Obviously, Raiden is a series that's been around a long time. And this actually has a couple games on it, I think. Uh, all three games have been authentically recreated for this collection and enhanced with new features. It's got Raiden Fighters, Raiden Fighters 2, and Raider, Raiden Fighters Jet. So really good shmup, Japanese shmup. Um, now, some of these pickups I maybe have necessarily not played yet, so if I don't know a lot about them, don't give me too hard of a time. But it's kind of a theme today is like a, a collection discs, because next up I have Tato Legends 1 for PS2 and Tato Legends 2 for PS2. So Tato Legends is basically just the arcade version, so some great games. Tato Legends 1 has 29 games on it. Tato Legends 2 has 35 games on it. Um, Dungeon Magic, Darius Gaiden, Puzzle Bobble 2... These are all on Tato Legends 2. Tato Legends 1 has Space Invaders, Jungle Hunt, Operation Wolf, Phoenix, Rainbow Islands, Space Invaders 2, Boston, Gladiator, Ninja Kids, so much good stuff. So that was kind of the theme of my pickup pile for this week was uh, was uh, collections. So that was uh, that was cool. There's some really good stuff in there. Um, so next up, we're going to do user question, and then we'll finish with... Um, we'll follow with my game of the week, and then we'll, uh, we'll finish up. We'll be done. So my question of the week today, <laughs> my question of the week today says, uh, what was your first Japanese RPG, and what do you think the major differences are between JRPGs and Western RPGs? So JRPG stands for Japanese RPGs, just in case you didn't know. Oh, my first Japanese RPG. Um... Technically, I want to say I remember watching a friend play Dragon Warrior on NES, but I never really played it. So I would have had to make the jump to Super Nintendo or Genesis, and I would say the first one I actually really played was probably Chrono Trigger or Fantasy Star 4. Those are going to be very much around the same time, probably Chrono Trigger, because I borrowed a Super Nintendo from a friend. I never had one growing up. Borrowed a Super Nintendo from a friend. Borrowed his copy of Chrono Trigger. And Chrono Trigger, uh, coincidentally enough, was the first game I ever skipped school to play. <laughs> I s pretended to be sick. I stayed home and said, today I'm beating Lavos. Uh, spoiler, I did not beat Lavos. <laughs> I played the game all day, <laughs> and I did not beat him. Uh, but it was uh, Chrono Trigger is is up there. Uh, so that and Fantasy Star 4 would have been the first two I put like actual real, real time into. Um, and as far as the second part of the question, what are the differences between that and Western RPGs? Well, initially, it was kind of play style. Like, Japanese RPGs were always turn-based. A lot of Western RPGs um, were, were action-oriented. Um, nowadays, though, that certainly gets blended as uh, people making Japanese RPGs in the West. <laughs> so they're just RPGs now. But oftentimes, Western RPGs are referred to as games with RPG elements that don't have typical RPG gameplay. So then you're, you're running into stuff like technically Baldur's Gate is an RPG. Uh, so Baldur's Gate would be considered an, a Western RPG because Baldur's Gate is a top-down isometric view. It's almost more like the Dungeons & Dragons rule set. So Planescape Torment, Neverwinter Nights, those are kind of considered Western RPGs as, uh, as opposed to Japanese RPGs, which were you know that turn-based combat, which obviously they've evolved too in a lot of Japanese RPGs now have live action combat and some back in the day did like star ocean valkyrie profile were japanese rpgs that did real-time combat tales of symphonia tales of destiny uh were always real-time combat games so they, they exist certainly um and even secret of mana you could argue was an rpg and that was live action on the super nintendo so but that was how i always kind of differentiated was japanese rpgs typically were they, they started at least in that turn-based combat and then western rpgs were usually referenced as the dungeons and dragons style you know um ma uh and 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 uh elder scroll stuff so your elder scrolls your dungeons and dragons your um Baldur's Gate, you know, because Baldur's Gate is Dungeons & Dragons. So Baldur's Gate, uh, Neverwinter Nights, Icewind Dale, uh, 
um, plane pools of radiance, planescape torment, stuff like that. Um, so that that's what I always I always kind of but obviously now it's completely blended now. But I think that's what people think of when they think of Japanese RPGs. Um, and then also you could argue the cutesy anime characters in Japanese RPGs, more rugged European medieval, like like uh, European medieval times, a lot of times in Western RPGs because that was the history we knew. A lot of Japanese RPGs go for more of a, you know, they go for more of a kawaii, cute sort of uh, aesthetic, I guess. So, um, But again, like I said, it's totally blended now, but that was back in the day. That was kind of how you differentiated between the genres, I think. Um, was uh, was kind of how that worked and then uh our game of the week so this is the game you should play so again our pickup pile is what i bought recently but then our game of the week is our recommendation of the week so my recommendation of the week for the sega genesis we're still on our genesis kick saturday night slam masters so saturday night slam masters is a wrestling game but it's made by capcom and it was an arcade game and saturday night slam masters is Basically, it plays like a Capcom beat em up, but inside of a wrestling ring. So, this is really good. Um, up to two players if you want to. Uh, but you can bounce off the ropes. Like, it's a, it's a wrestling game. It has wrestling physics instead of running down the street, like in Final Fight, beating guys up. You're in a wrestling ring beating guys up. But it still has the same sort of life bar system and special move systems uh, that, uh, that are known in those classic beat em ups. So, check it out. It's very awesome. I want to say a loose cart's around 20 bucks, and complete in box is probably 35 to 40 just roughly in the price range. Uh, I haven't looked it up recently. I don't have to All right, and that is the podcast for today. Thank you, everybody, as always, for listening and watching. Um, if you are listening to this on SoundCloud, you can subscribe on iTunes. Just go to the podcast app and search for Game Talk Radio. If you're listening to this on iTunes or SoundCloud and you want to subscribe to us on YouTube, I would love that. We're getting very, very close to 5,000. That's my that's my latest goal. And then after that, it's 10K, 10K or nay. And, uh, and so we're about 150 away from 5,000 right now. We're gaining about 250 to 300 subs a month. So that's pretty awesome. I'm very, very proud of that. So every three months, we get 1,000. So three times five. 15 months about another year maybe by next october a year october we would be at that 10,000 mark if all keeps going well um and uh and yeah and so you can subscribe to us on youtube at uh just do youtube.com slash drop rate and if you want to subscribe on twitch every monday night on twitch we do our podcast the Dropcast, and then we have uh, Tuesday, Jeremy usually streams Apex Legends and some Mordhaw, and I try to stream Thursday nights with my brother as well. Uh, so we do some streaming in there. That's twitch.tv slash the drop rate. So a little bit little bit different, a little bit separate there. Um, so thank you as always, everybody, for always listening and watching. I love it. I appreciate it so much. I do this every week. I love doing it. As long as you keep watching and listening, I'll keep doing it. So thank you, everybody, as always. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. any help you need you know I, i've been doing this now for eight years not to mention my time at gamestop for 11 years like I, i'm here uh i did the same thing for my friends at press start games a couple years ago uh and so uh he uh, appreciated that of course but also now he is letting us like he, he basically wants me to be a part owner in his business and, and uh that's i think that's pretty cool so uh yeah I, i'm gonna be a part owner of a new game store that's opening a uh, very part owner by the way it's very very minimal but it's you know it's it's something and i'll still be helping out with it so uh, if you get a chance to check it out in oshkosh i'll have more details in the future uh but i'm, I'm basically the reason i mentioned that was because i'm selling my old glass cases to rob so he's gonna come pick those up today i gotta get those down to oshkosh to help him and Yes, and so Understand. my day off quickly became not a day off. <laughs> um, but uh, in any case, uh, that's why I have to go into work today, but I didn't want to wait till Thursday to do the podcast, and who knows, I might be too tired on Thursday to even do it, and I might not want to do anything YouTube-related on Thursday since it's my only day off this week. So I thought let's just pump it out early in the morning. There's a couple things I want to talk about. Um, we've got this... Uh, Polygon put up a, a weird story, and I don't know how else to say it except it's just a weird story about anti-loot boxes being a threat to sports games, and it's full of the facts, um, but it's weird. It's taking a different angle, almost like 
you know, at first everyone jumped on him about, you know, all oh, the poor corporations. So we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then we've got um. Oh, uh, let's see here. There was some other story. Damn it! I has, I totally spaced on. It. I had my tabs open and I closed it. It's very early. Um, what was it? Oh, um, Mari Car got sued again. Um, <laughs> for like the billionth time, and they won again. Uh, so basically that's the uh, go karting service in Japan. I actually did it too. Um, it's super. F- fun uh i wish that more people would do it and so many people criticize it and they've never actually um never actually done it <laughs> you know and they, they act like it's garbage and it's stupid and it's really really uh unfortunate so we're gonna talk about that again and uh and maybe i'll tell some of my mari car stories again uh but so we got that and then i've got my pickup pile which is out of control I have a pickup pile of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 14 games that I picked up in the last week since our last podcast. And, of course, our game of the week here is waiting. So it might be a little bit shorter today as I go through these. But uh, um, but it's just, unfortunately, the, the nature of the beast this week with what I got going on. And, un- unfortunately, until this pays the bills, <laughs> this is how it's going to be. So, uh, so uh, without further ado... Uh, let's get the show rolling. So first on the podcast today, I really want to talk about this article that popped up on Polygon June Wait, 1st what? by Owen S. Other Good. Side. Owen's Good. <laughs> on Polygon. Basically, the headline, Anti-Loot Box Bill Poses a Real Threat to Sports Video Games. Which, in and itself, is accurate. You know, I don't think that's debatable. I think what's going to be debatable is is the angle uh, that some people take on this. And now, I hadn't read the article until this morning, and a lot of people on Twitter that blew up. And, uh, Jim Sterling, who I do enjoy his content, the Jim Quisition, was one of the first snarky people to tweet out about how, oh, the poor corporation, oh, the poor corporations, I'm Jim Sterling, son, the corporations. That was a terrible accent, but you get the point. <laughs> And, and and so I'm not uh, I'm not disappointed in that I, I guess I, I can understand why an article like this would come out and people are like well who cares about the triple A publisher we hate EA right we're willing to allow the government to regulate loot boxes we hate EA so much that's a lot of people's stance on this uh, which I am not one of those so uh, however it is an interesting take. And an angle that you may not have expected. And it is it is interesting to know if you don't play sports games, which a lot of people don't, who like are in gaming culture, who listen to gaming podcasts, sports games might be some of the games they skip out. But there's really the there's really like the the, the four big offenders I would say. FIFA Ultimate Team makes unbelievable amounts of money for EA. It's, it's their most profitable aspect, I believe. Yes, uh... Uh, NBA the NBA two K series. MLB okay, the show, and of course Madden Football. Those would be like the four biggest ones. And so the article goes on to say, if passed in anything close to its proposed form, Senator Josh Hawley, who we talked about uh, last week, his legislation will punish, if not obliterate, a staple genre of video gaming for offenses it never really committed. That may be fine with you. You may not like sports or their games. You may hate electronic arts because everything, because <laughs> everyone else does. But this is the feeling I get when I read the text of proposed... Protecting Children from Abusive Games Act. That's the name of the stupid legislation they're trying to pass. Because it goes well beyond what actually got everyone angry, which was Star Wars Battlefront 2's original loot boxes. Uh, yeah, I guess I could say it. That's, I mean, it's it's been, it was brewing for a while, but that was the one where it said, hey, it's a Star Wars game, so screw you, it's in your face. Uh, the list of no-nos the bill prescribes covers all the ways in which licensed team sports video games now make a lot, if not most, of their money. And that's not just FIFA Ultimate Team, which everyone loves to complain about while playing it endlessly. It's the similarly positioned My Career of NBA 2K. And it's the Diamond Dynasty for MLB The Show. So, right away, though, I understand why people got a little snarky with this article. Because instantly it's, you're wrong for complaining. Here's why these companies need to do it. And while I do agree with that, to an extent... (laughs) <laughs> this is something that's been a long time coming. And they were the ones who kept um, ex- 
extending and pulling and extending and pulling the video game companies until they reach this point where now we're in this nightmare, essentially, with the possibility of the government saying what can and cannot be in our video games. Now, will this ever pass? Who knows? Hawaii tried something very similar that did not pass. It, got, it didn't even leave committee. So it could be the same thing here. But again, you've got people who don't even play video games discussing the future of our hobby and our medium. So that should automatically concern you. Now, do I really feel sorry for sports games? Not particularly. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going I'm, I'm to be disappointed if EA doesn't make as much money. But here are some thoughts, and here's just some facts of the business, right? So because of this expected revenue, EA is able to spread money across the board to all projects. As a company, they have a budget based on their earnings, and that budget includes, and while EA certainly doesn't get super creative, if you think that them losing money on FIFA won't affect other projects that aren't sports games, you'd be wrong. It affects everything. It affects the bottom line. It affects, the, it affects everything. And, and so you might see things like, oh, you know, FIFA did really well this year. All these other sports games did well. We have a little bit of money for some experimental games here. Let's put some money into publishing tiny stuff. Um, they did a, a way out. You know, they publish, they, 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 they've they got their indie initiative where they're trying to publish it. Stuff. So they're, those projects could be affected by that. Now, again, could they still support those products and projects with the money they make? Outside of FIFA, yes. And so I'm not saying that like you have to support them to support indies, but that's just it's just a fact that they'll have less money to go around. Not to mention that thousands and thousands of people are employed by this company. And when they make less money, they have to trim some of that. And as much as in a perfect world we love for the CEO to take a 50% pay cut, it doesn't happen. That's not the way that um, our society works when it comes to how they pay heads of companies here. Uh, you know, it became a very uber competitive thing. It's almost like college coaches and how much they get paid. It has to do with competition and quality of work. And even though that person doesn't do the actual playing on the field, it's it's <laughs> that's just the structure of our corporate America. And, and and I could argue how how frustrating that is sometimes, but it is how it works. So as much as I'd love to see a CEO have his pay cut in half, so that we could have greater games and not have loot boxes and things. It just it's probably not going to happen, and that's okay. Um, so what I'd like to see going forward is, because this is essentially what's going to happen, I, what I'd like to see is this legislation die a horrible, horrible death. But before doing so, scares, uh, scares these companies into realizing that they need to regulate themselves before more people try to bring up legislation because it wasn't just about gambling for kids i mean if you look a lot of this stuff is pay to win and other things so it is what people were upset about the law covers that the legislation covers that but is that really what we want is again the government sticking their nose into it i, I personally don't and and uh and, and i'm not like i said i'm not losing sleep over the fact that ea might not make as many hundreds of millions of dollars as it does but that affects other things and you have to you have to understand that and so as we move on though where are we supposed to go from here? Um, well, <laughs> um, what I'd like to see is I think that the sports companies are the one company in the whole world that would make most sense to go to games as a service. You know, I think pe what was people's main complaint before the ultimate team and the random loot boxes and everything, long before all of that, people's argument was that they make a new Madden every year and it never changes. Right? There's a new sports game every year. They make minor changes, and they expect us to buy it. And then after a few years, they stop. Like, I don't even know how long. Maybe it's one year. But they stop doing roster updates for the old games. So if you want roster updates without trading the players yourself, you have to get the new game. But why wouldn't it make more than total sense for them to do these games as a games as a service, have seasons, just like how your actual sports have seasons, um, where you unlock things during the season pass by completing, essentially completing achievements, leveling up by playing so much, doing challenges, stuff like that. That seems to be the way these companies need to go. Now, will that make them as much money as, like, FIFA with their ultimate team system? Probably not. But it'll make them a lot more money than just selling a copy of the game every year. And so that's, I think, kind of the middle ground here. They have been pushing the boundaries of what's decent when it comes to these 
Um, I, don't know, I guess you'd call them microtransactions, but whatever. I mean, people even hack accounts to buy FIFA cards. Like, that was a big thing for on Xbox Live. People were hacking their accounts so they could buy FIFA Ultimate Points. It's so weird. But it, it is a big money-making thing. So, um, but that would make sense to me, right? Why, why aren't these games becoming a games as a service? That would make the most sense for a sports game. That way you're not releasing a new disc every year, but you're getting people to keep playing by offering them the bonuses. And that's and you offer the same sort of thing. If you, if you don't know what a season pass is, or sometimes they're called battle passes for certain games. And, and I'll be honest, I've recently finally come to know these well from the different games I've been playing because it's usually something I avoid in a game. So usually in free-to-play games, I'll have something called a battle pass that you buy. It's like 10 bucks. Usually I'd say it's like 10 bucks, maybe 20 if you want a booster. So it's like 10 bucks. And as you play through this quote-unquote season, as you unlock things and level up by playing more, you unlock hidden um, cosmetic items. You know, it could in, in FIFA and stuff, it could be alternate uniforms. It could be whatever. So you unlock different things that are typically cosmetic only. Every now and then you'll unlock some sort of booster, like you'll unlock um, a thing that, like I'm playing Dauntless, for instance, right now. And Dauntless is kind of like a Monster Hunter type game. So you'll unlock, like, a, you know, you'll unlock something like, a, what do I want to say, a, something like a, like a, a special potion that gives you a speed boost for the next mission you're on or something. So little things like that. Obviously, in a sports game, that would tilt the scales, so you really probably couldn't do that. Um, but you unlock that, and then there are things like the Battle Pass Plus, where you buy that, plus it gives you, because basically how it works is you do so many things and you just level up, and they'll have some, maybe a cap of like level 50, and every level you'll unlock something. Well, they'll also have something like the Season Pass, where you can buy in for another $10 above the normal Season Pass, and they'll give you like 15 free levels. So one that gets you free stuff unlocked quickly, uh, again, it's kind of like a pay-to-advance sort of situation, but also say you really wanted the final level 50 bonus, and... You couldn't, you know, you didn't have enough time to get it. You could pay money to boost yourself or whatever. So, you know, that's often how they get people who are really committed to these games to pay more. And if it sounds kind of skeevy, I mean, I feel like it was in the beginning too, but in a totally free-to-play game, I'm okay with that, especially if it's a free-to-play game that has legs and it, it, it will go for quite a while. So, um... <laughs> so, that to me makes sense. Why, I mean, in, in, in a in a based off of a, a, a video game franchise that literally has seasons in it, you could do something very similar. And you might have to do more seasons than that. You might have to do, like, the mid-season updates to get people to keep playing. But I think I think this would actually do more like, to keep people playing than, like, an ultimate team game. No, I don't know. That's just, that's just my thought. So part, part of some of this I found really interesting, though, was some of the numbers they had in here. So... In apparently 2K, Take Two Interactive. Um, it's instructive that Take Two agreed to a deal paying the NBA 1.1 billion dollars over the next seven years. So that's how much the NBA license cost Take Two Interactive. Now they obviously know how much money they're going to make, so them making this deal worked out because if they can still pay 1.1 billion dollars and still make enough money to make them happy. That means this game is generating some serious cash flow. But that's, you know, so what we might have to start seeing, and actually this could be a good thing for FIFA and, well, for FIFA fans and for Madden fans, maybe the uh, the license holders won't do exclusive deals anymore. Maybe you won't have an exclusive NFL yeah, license what I need anymore it. because Madden won't be able to pay as much as they want. So maybe we'd get to see other football games come to market. How cool would that be? Um, so we could see benefit, positive benefits from something like this. Um, probably won't. You know, EA is the type of company that would take less money to still have the exclusive rights. But um, but NBA, while it's not, it doesn't have exclusive rights to anything, it still paid that much money for non-exclusive rights. Crazy. It must. It, it should be crazy to see how much money they obviously make if they're willing to fork over 1.1 billion over seven years. And that was apparently double the last deal, which was uh, inked in 2011, well before virtual currency was introduced into the game. So originally, mm. the game, they made a deal for, I don't know, $500 million for the whatever amount of time. And now it's doubled because they already know the revenue coming from such a source. So basically, they're trying to say a lot of these deals were inked not using the revenue that they've been getting now. And now that they're getting this better revenue, they had to pay more for the license 
But if they lose that revenue source, they still have to pay more for license. You don't think the NBA is going to come back and say, ah, uh, you know, don't worry about it. We'll give you a deal since you're not making as much money. That's not how it works. And so what you could even see is maybe say we take that out and they're not able to make all that money back to pay for the license. You might see them not even make a basketball game in like 2K20 or 2K20. I mean, is it realistic? Probably not, but it's possible. These are sort of things that can happen. So, again, I have to stress, like, I'm not a fan of, of of these companies, and I don't think we should shed a tear for the lost money of the CEOs and the stockholders. But that all trickles down, and so there are ramifications and, and an impact when when a company like this has an issue like this. So it's just something to think about, just something to consider, just throwing it out there. Um because again, and, and I know I talked about this pretty much last week, but again, we have to separate our feelings about loot boxes and hating that style of monetization away from the argument that it's against, that it's hurting kids. Because once we hide behind the shield of kids, you will have people making laws that, um, that don't allow this. And, and specifically, and I talked about this last week, but specifically in the legislation, it's, it's very vague wording to things like, oh, if the game is played by kids or if it's or if the developers have knowledge that kids play the game. Well, of course kids play all... It, I sell copies of Grand Theft Auto to kids all the time with their parents' permission, mind you. But parents come in all the time and I'm like, hey, just so you know, this game's got really bad stuff in it. Do you still want them to buy it? And they look at the kid and the kid goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the parent goes, oh, he, he plays it at his cousin's house. And then they just buy it. So is that fair that I can't have mature-themed games because that parent lets their kid play it? Right, so again, that's an issue with Josh Hawley's legislation about loot boxes, but it's that's that's what we're giving up for our hatred of loot boxes. Is we're trying to we're, we're letting the government step in to try to fix a problem for us when we could easily fix that problem ourselves. And 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 really, is it a problem when you don't have to play those games? I mean, gaming right now is bigger than it's ever been. There's there's way more games that I could ever play in a lifetime that I'd want to play available right now. Who cares if Madden ho horribly abuses loot boxes? I don't have to. I don't have to play Madden. <laughs> I can just forget it. I got a million other things on my plate. So I feel like that's as consumers, that's the decision we have to make. And yes, I know there's people who boycott EA and but that's great. That's good stuff. If you're not happy with a product, don't buy it. Brand loyalty is stupid. Don't do that. But you know that's how we vote with our dollars. Not trying to get the government to step in and fix it. Um, but it is interesting because Polygon got a lot of heat on this article about, you know, oh, being pro-corporation is disgusting how pro-corporation is. I mean, I think it's a pretty accurate situation. But the beginning definitely has this tinge of, you know, it's going to obliterate sports games. I don't want to see my sports games go away. And that's okay because that's important to this writer. This writer cares about those things. And while I don't, I don't have the same sentiment that he does, but it's fine. You know, it's his opinion. Uh, it's my opinion that uh, that we we I wish loot boxes would go away and be replaced with something that made more sense that wasn't as abrasive, um, but also doesn't cause these companies to lose a bunch of money because these companies support thousands of employees. It's like when people talk about they can't wait for GameStop to shut down, but then they'll criticize, you know, a company for cutting a hundred people from its payroll because it needed to cut costs. Well, if GameStop shuts down, that's thousands and thousands of people out of work. If EA were to lose a bunch of money, they will fire people to make up that cost. So let's just not be hypocritical about it is all. And it's, that's not a dig on anyone. It's just let's let's not be hypocritical. Let's understand the situation and then try to be, you know, try to be consistent in our choices and in the things we fight for. And and I think we need while we need to push back against this practice that we don't like, having legislation come in is not the key. And so I think the Polygon article did a fine enough job making this argument, but it was definitely, there was there was a tinge of like the writer putting in his own opinion of how much they don't want to see the sports genre disappear. All right, and so next up on the podcast today, we're going to be talking about Mari Car again uh, because they got sued by Nintendo again and they lost again. And this sucks um, because I, when I was in Japan, I took a Mari Car tour and not counting be getting engaged to my now wife, it was the coolest thing I did in Japan by a lot. 
<laughs> if I had not done it on the last night we were there, I would have probably done it again. Um, so, uh, but the story begins. Many people have heard of Mari Car by now, a Japanese go-kart rental company. Uh, that's not, that's not really accurate, but okay. That lets customers live the Mario Kart dream by letting customers dress up as the video game's characters and zoom around the streets of Tokyo. Such a concept would have been brilliant if not for the fact that Mario Kart brazenly carried out this operation without Nintendo's express approval. So, first of all, this article's already, Sora News 24, I guess, uh... I, this is already like a biased article, but let's why not? Let's just go. Through. This spurred Nintendo to file a lawsuit calling for the cease and desist of character costume rentals. Now that's really the issue. First of all, there was an issue about the name Mari Car, which I thought they that they that Mari Car won that argument. They were trying to argue that it was too similar to the word Mario Kart, which obviously Mari Car you could argue is, but Car spelled with a C, Mario Kart K with a Kart with a K. I mean. Yes, I guess, <laughs> you know, but you, you, they should have been okay with that. Now, when I was there, yes, they basically, now here they make it sound like you rent the suits separately. You don't. So once you rent a cart, they have just a closet full of suits that you can wear, but I don't think it's required. I, I mean, I put on like a Mario hoodie and I think I had an Iron Man mask I was going to put on, but it, it limited my visibility so much. I thought it wasn't a good idea to be driving a go-kart in a city I'm unfamiliar with at night while also wearing an Iron Man mask. Even though it was, it, it would have been pretty sweet. Um, and uh, and uh, anyway, so it says perhaps it was Mari Car's mobility, Mari Mobility. So apparently they had to change the name to Mari Mobility, or maybe they changed it just to try to get out from under it. Uh, the offending company then appealed against being ordered to pay 10 million yen in damages because they were allowing people to dress up as Mari characters, which I, I'm fine with. I think that was probably pushing it too far. You know, you can, you don't have to, like, that wasn't the appeal. Like, the appeal of this was the go-karting, you know. Um, court proceedings are now underway to determine the amount of damage to be awarded to Nintendo, which could potentially end up even higher than the original sum of 10 million yen. We will continue to take necessary measures against infringements of our brand in order to protect our valuable intellectual property that we have developed over the years, Nintendo commented. Um, so... Now, this says Japanese netizens simply shook their heads at Mari Mobility's folly. Here are some quotes, which I'm pretty sure these are Reddit quotes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure because I think I saw the Reddit article about this. But here are the quotes. Quote, they're idiots. Did they really think they could beat Nintendo's legal team? Quote, it's sad that this service is still operating. Good job, Nintendo. Quote, it's only a matter of time before it disappears from Tokyo forever. Quote, that's the strongest legal team right there. Quote, is this whole fiasco still going on? <laughs> End quotes. So, I don't know. Those are just five quotes that are in this article, and I feel like those are just Reddit comments or, or Twitter replies. It's it's pretty terrible. They don't even say who said them. Uh, speeding around Tokyo dressed up as Mario, Luigi, or Princess Peach seems like it's hurting, uh, excuse me, hurtling, hurtling towards its final days at the speed of a judge's gavel slamming down, which is probably for the best, really, considering how easily those dangerous go-karts get into accidents. That's, again, the article. Um... Yeah, uh, okay, so I, I feel like there's a lot of issues here, um, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to find out what the lawsuit actually was, because I think what it was was they were, they were fighting against, let's see here, um, so there was a cease and desist order, and they were supposed to pay this $90,000 US, or like 10 million yen, or whatever it was, and so they basically, they, they filed an appeal to that, and so it looks like... Um, it looks like that, that that appeal was denied. So it's th this headline's also misleading, saying that it wins a lawsuit again. It's more that they appealed the original verdict, and they lost that appeal. So they're going to have to pay up. In fact, they might have to pay more now, depending on what they decide. But uh, so it's not that, like, new legislation was brought against them. So so that's that's what was frustrating a little bit with the article twos are acting like this is something new and it was just a lost appeal basically but i have real issues with them saying um that uh that people hated this okay so i can only speak from my personal experience okay but i as myself as someone who took the tour and who did this i am the first one to say it seems silly that it's allowed <laughs> i'm the first one to say it it is, you don't wear helmets. The go-karts can go decently fast, especially when I got going down a little bit of a hill. I mean, I felt good. Now, 
I felt, I would say I felt like I was going like 35, 40 miles an hour in a go-kart. Who knows what I was actually doing? Probably 20, I don't know, 25 maybe. I don't know, because you're just going fast and you're in a go-kart, and it feels a lot faster than it is. Um, these tours were guided. Uh, like, people argue that, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a menace to the streets. When, when they drive, the tour guides, there's one in the front, one in the back. They're very mindful of the traffic. So when you're driving, you drive single file. But when you park at lights, you double up. They have rules in place to try to not be so abrasive to traffic. And then they have us all move together. So from a safety standpoint, yes, I, you probably should have to wear helmets. But I don't know. Japan's different that way. Like, they have a lot more personal accountability when it comes to these things. They're not as, you know, they're not as a litigious a country as we are. So not everything has to be thought of as like, well, if you don't wear a helmet, you get hurt, you'll sue us. So you have to wear a helmet. They don't, not everything's done that way here. Like a, a quick story, I went on a paddle boat tour, and we went underneath this, it was like with the rising, in Hiroshima, the rising tide, and lowering tide, we went underneath this shrine, and our tour guide just said, when you, when you go by this, don't touch it, please. I'm like, okay, and we didn't. But in America, you wouldn't just have that, you'd have big chains around it, and big things around it, saying, you can't even go near it, because they don't trust people not to touch it, right? So it's different there, like they have a different expectation of people's behavior. Uh, which is awesome. I actually think it's quite great. And so, from a safety aspect, I, c I can see that argument. And and if it's stupid tourists, um, I saw a lot of really annoying tourists when I was there, and most were American, and they were really disrespectful to the place. And so it's possible. But our tour group was great. It went really well, and it was a lot of fun. Um, we even picked up someone whose cart had broken down, and apparently his other group had lost him. <laughs> Um, but again, so I do think it's fun. And, and as much as people say, why don't they just do a closed course or make it like real go-karting? Some of the appeal is that you're actually driving these on city streets. And they do, I mean, it was fun. It was really, really fun. And I, I, I've always enjoyed go-karts, so I guess if you don't like go-karts, you wouldn't like this anyway. But it was really fun. And, and I'm not saying that, that they weren't ab abrasive in, in, um, in, in their using of Mario Kart costumes. I don't think, I, I think if they were smart, they wouldn't have done that. You know, why poke the beast, right? They could have just had it where you're in tours of cars called Mario Cars. They look like Mario Kart go karts a little bit. Like, you probably could have got away with it. But then you have people dressing up as Disney and Mario and Nintendo characters. Like, yeah, they're going to run into problems there. So they should have been smarter. I, I don't have a problem with that. And I also don't have a problem with them appealing, losing a lawsuit. Everybody should. Um, if you really think that you did nothing wrong, and if they lose that appeal, then the courts decide against you, and that's how it goes. But they're in every one of their rights to appeal a lawsuit or, or a judgment, just as much as Nintendo was in their right to file in the first place. Um, but a lot of people... Oh, so getting back to one of the other things is that people will argue how everyone in Tokyo hates it. Uh, I couldn't... Our experience was not could not be further from the truth. We would go to intersections where we would stop. You'd have people on the side of the corner waving, laughing, taking pictures, um, like with their phones and not with cameras. These people I don't believe were tourists. You saw businessmen walking around that would laugh and, and, and think it was funny. Um, we had, um, and I know this is different because it's a little girl, but my, my wife, my now wife, my then fiance, was dressed up as Minnie Mouse in her costume. And this little girl saw her when we parked at an intersection. And the little girl was just like, Minnie, Minnie. And she just, it was adorable. Okay, so that kid, and then we waved and she waved and it was so really awesome. So, like, to act like everybody in Tokyo hates this, that's not true. And <laughs> I and I know what I'm saying is just right from my experience. But we had a great experience doing it. And I, I, I said that everybody who hates it needs to do it because it's super fun. And I don't think them losing this lawsuit is going to hurt them because they're they're growing and growing. I mean, they, they've been, I think they're putting a lot of money in the bank. I think they'll be okay. But, you know, they, they skirted a line for a while and, and they got caught. And, and I think it's fair that Nintendo can say, you know, what, we don't want you wearing our costumes of our characters on the street if in case some of these do get an accident because you never know who might think Nintendo is liable because of that. Or if they see people driving around as Mario on the streets, think that that's a Nintendo thing. And so I think that's fair. And I think they should have to pay up. Um, because I think that they, they were pushing boundaries. But to just say that this service should just go away, I really think that'd be doing a disservice. And I, I really challenge anyone who enjoys stuff like this to really try it out if you're ever there.
and I understand if you've never been there, if you don't think you'll ever go, and you look at this and you think it's childish and stupid, that's okay. I'm just saying it was really fun, and from somebody, and again, I like go-karting, but I, man, it was it was just so cool, and uh, we went in the afternoon, it started in the afternoon, and then went into the evening, so we, we drove during the sunset, we were driving on what essentially looked like a highway at night, so it looked just like, um, just like, like Mario Kart stages, it was so cool, and I have great video of it, and, and it was awesome. But I also understand that there are a lot of people out there who are really dumb and who don't pay attention, who probably are taking pictures and taking selfies while driving, and they probably would crash because they're morons. And and that's but that's in real life too. I mean, that's that's real cars do the same thing. It's horrible. But you know, I, I just I, I would hate to see them go away because it was it was quite an enjoyable memory for me. And I am uh, my wife and I are planning to go back to Tokyo in 2021. So when we go back. I, I hope it's around so I can do it one more time. All right, so yeah, I uh, man, that that I don't know. It makes me mad when I read all these negative things about Mario Kart because most people that have complaints about it have never done it, and I hate people who complain about things and th say say things suck when they haven't actually had any experience with it. And so that bums me out. Um, I know there was one other thing I wanted to talk about. Something with collecting. And it doesn't matter. Um, I, I gotta get going anyway. So we have our uh, our pickup pile of the week, and then we have our game of the week. So first, let me get the game of the week out of the way because this uh, this uh, won't take as long <laughs> since I have so much in my pickup pile. So uh, the game of the week is for the NES this week, and it is a game called A Boy and His Blob. If you've never played this game before, at first it looks like your normal side-scrolling platformer, but a boy and his cute little blob named uh, uh, from the distant planet Blobonia <laughs> in search of an earth boy to help him save his world. Join him on this fantastic adventure in mysterious caverns beneath the earth searching for treasures. Then travel to Blobolonia to battle the evil emperor. Discover Blob's amazing appetite for jelly beans and the different transformations that occur with each flavor. Learn to use these shapes to overcome even the most outrageous obstacles. A Boy and His Blob is a fantastic journey filled with constant surprises and humorous characters. Yes, <laughs> it is. But here's the interesting thing. It's actually more of a puzzle game. It reminds me more of a point-and-click game than it does a side-scrolling platformer because you'll get somewhere and say you need a ladder. Well, you have to feed your blob certain jelly beans, and it'll turn them into a ladder, so then you can use the ladder and access the place you want to be. One area you can turn the blob into, like, a black hole. You jump down, and it takes you, like, through the floor. And so it's not really a side-scrolling platformer. It's kind of a difficult game because I don't think they really tell you what the jelly beans do, but then they also give you a limited number of said jelly beans. So if, like... You know, you waste all the ladder ones forgetting what they do, and then you make a ladder. You're like, oh, shoot, I need a ladder now, and you don't have the jelly bean ladders. Like, I believe that you just can't advance. But I don't remember 100% sure. And Jenny and I were playing through this one. We got to play through it again um, because she used to play it as a kid, too, and I, I absolutely love that game. But uh, for the NES, A Boy and His Blob, check it out. It's pretty fun. <clears throat> okay, so for my game pickups of the week, or for my, my pickup pile... Um, this is a doozy. I'm just going to go through the PS2 stuff because I, I got some PS4 games from Limited Run. The only one I do want to talk about is Limited Run did a collector's edition of Curse of the Moon. That's the Bloodstained spin-off game that was made by Inti. Uh, Inti Creates, and they basically made the box look like the Castlevania 1, 2, and 3 boxes with the silver sides and the art in the middle. It's top-notch collector's edition. Uh, it's so awesome, and being a Castlevania fan like I am... It's pretty great, and uh, and it's a really awesome collector edition. That's the PS4 version. They also did a Vita and a Switch version. But let's get to this. So, <laughs> so much here. Uh, actually, and I have another pile of stuff I brought home yesterday, which I'll save for next week's pickup pile because it would have been twice as many as what I have here. <clears throat> Lately, I've been on a really big horror kick and uh, RPG kick. Um, and so I've been picking up a lot of a lot of weird randos here and there for PS2 and, and stuff. And yesterday we had a PS2 and PSP trade that was pretty good. Um, but first up, uh, I picked up a physical copy of Metal Slug 4 and 5 for the PS2. Uh, now, they released a Metal Slug anthology for the PS2, which has every Metal Slug game on it. But I love, love, love Metal Slug. So even though 4 and 5 are on the, and, uh, on the anthology pack, I still picked that up. 
I still uh, picked up Metal Slug 4 and 5 because 4 and 5 are on separate discs, actually, too. It's, it's pretty cool. So it's a two-disc game. The box art's awesome. Metal Slug, if you've never played it, first of all, how dare you? And second of all, it's basically Contra-style gameplay, but with this much, much better sprite animated uh, kind of comedy look to it. Uh, everything's incredible. Like, the game just looks awesome. It's an old SNK arcade game that they recorded. Um, so then we're moving on to an RPG for PS2 called Makai Kingdom. Now, before I opened Game Trade, I was collecting PS1 and PS2 RPGs. That was my collection. And um, so I had this game, and I sold all this stuff when I opened my store. Like, when people came to my store opening night, every PS1 game I had was like an RPG. So imagine going to a store and seeing like 100 PS1 games for sale, and every one of them is the rarest games on the PS1. That was what my store had the first day open. So... Uh, Makai Kingdom, though, is, is, you know, it's kind of a generic uh, tactics RPG, but it's, you know, it was it's going in the collection. Like I said, we're in a big RPG kick right now. Um, Burnout 3 was the next one I picked up. So uh, this is the last one that I enjoyed of the Burnout franchise, but Burnout 2 and Burnout 3 are just excellent games. Crash Mode is still one of my favorite modes created, I think, in any game. And if you've never played Burnout, um, it's it's a racing game. It's whatever. Uh, it's very fast paced. In fact, you you get like speed modifiers for doing like close calls and power sliding around corners, and you build up like this heat meter, this fire meter that keeps going up as you do more dangerous and dangerous driving, and then eventually you're going so fast that you just zip into these levels. Love it. Um, burnout. Uh, so the crash mode though is a predetermined intersection with predetermined traffic. And it's timed, and your mission is to drive into that intersection and cause as much damage as humanly possible. And so you drive into this thing full speed, and then you watch the cars like explode and blow up and chain react into other explosions. And the whole time it's ticking a money counter, like 5,000 damage, 20,000 damage, 100,000 damage, blowing up a semi-tank, or like, it's awesome. And we used to sit around drinking, playing this game, and we just would pass the controller, like, can you beat my score? Can you beat my score? Just, just awesome. Um, so yeah, Burnout, definitely really good. Uh, another racing game I finally put in the collection, a game I've always enjoyed, I just never had it in the collection, but uh, Need for Speed Underground 2. Uh, Underground 2 changed the formula of Underground 1, made it an open world racing game. You drive around, you find hidden shops for upgrades, you, you go out driving, uh, free roam driving. It was one of the first Need for Speed games I think that was free roam. Um, which Midnight Club 3, I think, did before this one, because Need for Speed Underground, which I love also, had no free roam at all. It just went, You just went race to race to race. This game has a whole like city you drive around, but you still have all the customization options that you do of the previous. Of all the previous. Um, then we have another PS2 RPG called La Pucelle Tactics. Uh, La Pucelle Tactics is uh, another cutesy JRPG Um you know, I don't know. Like I said, I'm on, J I'm on a Japanese RPG kick right now, so I just I had to have it. And I'm, I'm putting a lot of these games that I used to have in my collection back in my collection now. La Pucelle, if I remember correctly, this came out just after Disgaea. And so Disgaea had kind of been this, hey, these obscure Japanese RPGs are going to start coming out in the States. Excuse me, I'm yawning already. That's not a good sign. They're going to start coming out in the States. Uh, and so then people like companies like Mastiff were publishing Japanese games and paying to have them brought over and, and sell them. And then finally, I can't believe I didn't have either one of these, but I picked up both the Champions games for PS2. So Champions of Norath and Champions Return to Arms. They play similarly to Diablo, I guess I would say, um, or Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance if you played that. Um, and they're excellent, and they take place in the EverQuest oh, universe. Shit. Um, and it's really good, and you can have up to four players if you have a multi-tap. And I want to say that the character transfers from the first one to the second one, I think. Yeah, you can import your champion from the first game. So you can play the first one, build up characters, and then switch to the second one. But they're really good, um, you know, Western RPGs, I guess you would call them. So, you know, that kind of top-down, uh, isometric view, um, hack and slash. And so kind of like a Diablo or like a Baldur's Gate. But really, really good, so... There's that. Um, yeah, all right. And so I guess that's actually that's it for today. Uh, uh, I did my, my pickup pile. I didn't have a user question this week. I got my game of the week done. had a couple news stories for you all. So uh, with that being said, I know it's a little bit shorter, but thank you again for coming along for the ride this week. Uh, I should be back to form next week, back to normal. 
I think. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's it, like I was planning. I didn't have this all planned until last Friday. All of a sudden, I had to get these cases ordered, and they're like, oh, we can only do it Tuesday. We can only deliver Tuesday morning. I'm like, oh, it's like the one day I try not to do anything except this podcast and my YouTube stuff. Fine. It is what it is. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you as always for listening and watching. And uh... All right, guys. How did it go to work?